I'd like to uh, direct our attention uh, to uh, our study for today. And I want to make a confession or two. Uh, this has been by far the most difficult time spiritually and uh, theologically in my life. This is harder than going to school and trying to study theology in school. In school you have uh, some professors to guide you and some colleagues to work with. But what we're doing here is we're trying to undo a great deal of learning which I now believe was incorrect and not biblical. And to undo that and look for what the Bible really teaches us without the prejudicial uh, history that comes with me and with my knowledge and experience is very hard. And when you don't have some uh, great scholars or people that you can depend on, uh, it becomes even more difficult. Uh, I'm fortunate that I have uh, one gentleman who is a professor at uh, University at Adventist University, who is uh, watching and uh, guiding and uh, affirming the things that we are learning. I'm grateful to him and uh, also grateful to God, the Holy Spirit, who's leading us through some of the great and important doctrines that we have to uncover. The problem in using outside sources is here. When you use a commentary, or a series of commentaries, which I try to do, you can get opinions from various theologians. But you've got to know where those theologians study and what their belief is, and what their interpretation is. For example, if I go to a theologian who comes from uh, the Moody Institute in Chicago, or from the really well-known, the strongest evangelical seminary in Dallas, Theological Seminary, where most of the evangelical Protestant pastors come from, they teach dispensational theology. And I have to reject dispensational theology because I don't believe it's biblical. It's something that was introduced in the 1820s, and it re, re, redefines the timing of God. And as we'll see today, God has appointed times and those times are very, very important. I don't believe it's, I don't believe it's possible that 1827, somebody comes up with this idea of this seven dispensations, seven divisions of time in which the Bible is divided and the gospel changes according to that. To that end, I'll tell you, I was reading last night, quite late into the evening, about 11.15, I uh, noticed I got an email, and it was from a organization to which I belong, which uh, really is an organization of theologians where uh, there are several thousand articles that are uh, read, uh, it, it, some rejected, some accepted, and they're put into this organization for a wider distribution. But most of the writers there are Seventh-day Adventists. So it gives me a good, deep view of all the various doctrines of the Adventist Church from various different theologians. So I know that when I understand, that, when I, that I get an understanding of a certain doctrine from the Adventist Church, I get a deep, and a deepest view, much deeper than the 28 fundamental beliefs. Last night I got one of these emails, and I couldn't help but notice it was attached, and it was, uh, it, it was recommended to me because of a previous paper that I had uh, read on William Miller in 1844. This one, however, was related to the trumpets of Revelation. I was very curious. I had to get up out of my bed, where I was reading, go into the living room, open up the laptop, and read the article, and for no other reason except because the person who wrote it. It was Dr. Hans Lorendale, one of the brightest minds that have ever come out of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. There are several others 
several others. But I was very interested. As I began to read it, about a third of the way in, I became very disappointed. Very disappointed. Why? Because he cited Ellen White more than once. And I have already found out that that is not a dependable source. So while I was reading, I stopped. I went to the end of the article and noted there were only five, only five outside sources cited. And within those was Ellen White. But I kept reading. And as I read further, I noticed that he made mention of a certain trumpet, the sixth trumpet, being during the age of the church. This is the age of the church. Immediately I recognize that as dispensational theology. Because the dispensational theology divides up the spiritual history of this world by the seven different ages. And how disappointed I was that dispensational theology and the writings of a proven false prophet are the foundations of these doctrines. I had to close the article, went back to my reading, and to the Word of God, because that is the source where we have to go for our doctrines and for our teaching. In order for us to understand the teachings of the gospel, and in order for us to defend the gospel, we have to understand the attacks against the gospel. There are those who question our studies. Should we be studying this on Sabbath? Should this be part of our subject during our divine service? Yes, it should be. Why? Because we're studying the Word of God. And what we're doing is educating our congregation and all those who listen to what the Word of God really says. And because the Word of God is being attacked from many sources, we have to focus on those sources with which we are more familiar than others. In my personal experience, the source that is attacking the gospel more than any other is the teaching that we can, and in fact we are expected to gain our righteousness, and we're expected to gain salvation and eternal life and heaven through our keeping of the law. The teaching that, that Revelation 14, 12 says, here are those that keep the commandments of God. That teaching is against teaching of the gospel. The teaching that the remnant still exist is against the teaching of the covenant of Abraham. In order for us to understand how we're going to respond to these doctrines, we need to know what those doctrines are, meaning the wrong doctrines, and then we've got to compare them to the actual biblical doctrines. To that end, the doctrine of the investigative judgment has become a focal point of our study and our discussions here. Why? Because those that teach that on the Day of Atonement, in 1844, not earlier, in 1844, on the Day of Atonement, what they say is October 22nd, which by the way was not, it was September 23rd was the Day of Atonement in that year. But the, the, on the Day of Atonement was the beginning of the, what is called the investigative judgment. In that investigative judgment, God reviews all the sins First, of those that have died and who claim to be people of God. And then those that are alive, and God reviews all of their sins. And God reviews which sins have been, forgiven, have been confessed and which have not been 
And that even those sins that are forgotten, God holds against us. This is the teaching. We cannot build a doctrine on one Jewish festival, on one Jewish feast, the Day of Atonement, without knowing what the Day of Atonement was. How did the Jews see the Day of Atonement? How did God see the Day of Atonement? What was he doing? What was he teaching? What was he supposed to do? And then we have to make sure that we are not misapplying the work that God gave or the symbols that God gave for the Day of Atonement, that we're not misapplying them in our interpretation of Scripture. We have to go further. We cannot learn, understand, or extract anything of value from the Day of Atonement, also called Yom Kippur by the Jews, we cannot extract the meaning of Yom Kippur by studying the Day of Atonement in a vacuum, you understand. Why? Because the Day of Atonement by itself cannot be understood unless you understand the other feasts and festivals. Does that make sense? Now, if you ask Christians, we pretty well know what Passover is. But do we know the other feasts? Do we know the other feasts? What is the first feast in the Jewish calendar? This is very important and it's going to get even more important. There are seven major feasts in the Jewish agricultural year, in the Jewish calendar. And then there are others that were added later on which we will not study. Yeah, we may have one time, but we will focus now on the seven. The first is Passover. We studied this around Christmas time. We discussed this briefly. Passover. Then there's the feast of, anybody else know what the next one is? Unleavened bread. Come on now, you guys have phones. You can look it up. Okay, then there's unleavened bread. Then the third is first fruits. These three all come close to one another. They come bang, bang, bang right on each other's heels. All together. In the first month. And then, 50 days afterward, 50 days afterward, comes the feast of Pentecost. Okay? 50 days after the third feast, which is the first fruits, comes the Feast of Weeks, also called Pentecost. Now remember the 50th day. That's it. That'll become important as we study. Then nothing happens for a little while. Then comes the seventh month, the Tishri. In the seventh month, we have what is called the Feast of Trumpets. Feast of Trumpets. After the Feast of Trumpets comes the Day of Atonement. And immediately after comes the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, let me ask you a question. The Day of Atonement or any one of those feasts, would they make sense to us without knowing what they all meant? This, these seven feasts, are God's teaching the salvation history of humanity. This is the history of salvation. From start to finish, what God planned to do and how he fulfilled it. We can't just dump the Day of Atonement and say, ah, this is the Day of Atonement. On this day, the judgment starts. No. There is judgment. But it's not on the Day of Atonement. We, it's there. But in order for us to get to the Day of Judgment, we've got to understand what happens before. 
There are two other important dates. One is the weekly Sabbath, which God gave to the people of Israel. In Exodus, he says, this is a sign. This is a sign between you and me for the covenant that God gave the people of Israel. Then there was another very, very, very important festival. It was called the Year of the Jubilee. The Year of the Jubilee. Anybody familiar with that? Most people would not be. I spoke about this at our Lutheran church a few weeks ago because Jesus referred to the year of the Jubilee at the Last Supper. So during that sermon, I explained what the year of the Jubilee is, but I'll explain that today. Well, why, is the, why are these important to us? And what do they have to do with the covenant? Let me tell you. What was God's first redemptive covenant with Abraham? This is a review now. I will give you seed like the stars of the sky and the sand of the sea, right? I will give you land where you can live and prosper, right? Third, through you, three or four nations will be blessed. All nations will be blessed. In order for God to make that commitment, to make that covenant come true, he then had a follow-up miniature covenant with Moses and the people of Israel. And by the way, God had told uh, Abraham already in advance that because of their sins, I will put your people in slavery for how many years? Here's a 400 years. 400 years where? In Egypt. He even told them that. God has a time and God has a place. God has plans for salvation. 400 years. And after the 400 years, God brings them out. And he says, now I'm going to take you to that land that I promised. The seed is there. And there was almost 3 million of them. The seed is there. But now they need a place to prosper out of slavery. And I'm going to take them there. And there he gave them a new covenant under which they were going to have the civil law, the rules of the land, if you will, that they're going to live under. Then they were going to have the moral law, which shows them that they are weak and sinful and they need to confess their sins. And in order to go through that confession, God gave them the ceremonial laws related to the temple. Related to the temple. Within that, within that explanation that God gave them, He also gave them not only the seven feasts, He also gave them the burnt offerings. He gave them the various offerings for sin offering, for thank offering, and other weekly and daily sacrifices. Within the daily sacrifices, God gave them a way that they could confess their sins. Now, here's what happened. Along with the seven festivals that we talked about before, which were the high holy days. Only three of them required the head of the household to be at Jerusalem for those. We will go into those. But then there were the daily sacrifices which were made. There was a burnt offering. Burnt offering. This is given to us in Leviticus chapter 4. Burnt offerings. This is Leviticus 1. It was a bull, a ram, or male bird. This was for atonement, for unintentional sin in general. This is devotion. This is worship. Then there was grain offering. Again, worship, recognition of God's goodness, thankfulness to God. Fellowship offering. This would be any animal without defect. Perfect animal. This is a voluntary act of worship given to God and thanking God for a community and 
the families. Sin offering, this was mandatory, expected, required for specific sins, confession of sin. Guilt offering, this was mandatory atonement for intentional sin requiring restitution. So understand, God made provision for humans to go and give their offerings that their sins may be acknowledged and forgiven. And there they were at the temple all year long. This was daily. This was every day you could go except for those high holy days. On those days, though, there were special, special work for the people of God to do. Now, with that said, I want to spend just a little bit of time going through the various feasts. We're going to have today just a basic introduction to each of the feasts. After that, after this week, as of next Sabbath, we're going to review every feast in detail so everybody understands and becomes a student of the Jewish feasts and what their meanings are. You know why? Because when you come to the Day of Atonement, it will make sense. Okay? The first one, let's go to Leviticus chapter 23. We began with our service today with reading that passage. Leviticus chapter 23. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, these are my appointed festivals, the appointed festivals of the Lord, which you are to proclaim as sacred assemblies. I want to spend a few minutes just reviewing this, only because every word that comes out of the mouth of God is important. Okay? The Lord, take note. You remember when we studied Isaiah? When the word Lord is all capitalized, L-O-R-D, who is speaking? God, Jehovah, the Creator. The God, the Father is speaking to Moses. He says, speak to who? To who? Speak to the children of Israel. And say to them, these are what? My appointed festivals. First of all, whose festivals are they? Whose are they? Is it the people asking for the festivals? No. Who's asking for them? God is asking for the festivals. If God is asking for something, do you think it was something important? It's God the Father. Telling Moses, these feasts are important. These are my feasts. And then he says, they are my appointed festivals. What does appointed mean? What is the word? When you make, when you make a, yes. The word appointed or appointment is about what? It's about time. It is about time. If you make an appointment, with somebody, and that somebody doesn't show up. How do you feel about that? I fear somebody like me, if you got, you know, when I was in business, even if I had to go and do a big contract, if somebody kept me waiting 15 minutes, and I was the one making the sale, I'd leave. Why? Appointments are important. These are appointed times of who? So keep in mind that God has a time and God has an activity for which there is a purpose. It's not just for the fun of it. There's very specific reasons for it. The appointment, and notice this. He says that the appointment festivals of the Lord, he says it twice, these are my appointed festivals. Then he says appointed festivals of the Lord doesn't want them to miss that, who it is that's giving them the order for the festivals. God does not want that to be ignored. Which you may choose to proclaim to the sacred assemblies. Is that what it says? 
which you are too, which you have too. Give it to whom? Your people. You have to teach this to those that are believers. And this, by the way, will become important when we come to Revelation. Because the book of Revelation, you will notice, is not written to the non-believing world. Even there are many who use it to try and convert people or scare people into the church. It's written to who? To the seven churches. This is a message of God to his people that is in the new covenant. The churches. This is the old covenant. To who? The people of Israel. Which you are to proclaim. You have no choice, but you have to share it to the sacred assembly, to those that have been chosen by God to represent him. Sacred assemblies is a regular occurrence. This, we will see, one of them is a weekly occurrence. The other, as we go on in chapter 25, is an occurrence every 50 years. And then there's an annual occurrence. These are the regular assemblies. Verse 3. There are six days when you may work, but the seventh day is a day of Sabbath rest, a day of sacred assembly. You are not to do any work. Wherever you live, it is a Sabbath to the Lord. This was a well-known teaching to the Jews. They had forgotten about it. And we know that God was expecting them to observe the Sabbath even before the Ten Commandments were given. How do we know that? Because on the way to Sinai, God gave them manna, but he did not give them manna on the Sabbath. He gave them a double portion on Friday so they could eat it on the Sabbath. Now we get into, so we know and we have studied the seventh day Sabbath, the Jewish Sabbath teaching that goes back way before the commandments. Look at verse 4. These are the Lord's appointed festivals. The sacred assembly you are to proclaim at their appointed times. Once again, take note of the appointed times. In other words, if it's Passover, if it's Unleavened bread, if it's first fruits, if it's wheats, the Feast of Weeks, if it's the Feast of Trumpets, if it's a Day of Atonement, if it's a Day of the Tabernacles, every feast must be observed on the time that God has assigned. On time. The first one is Passover. We're not going to go into details of any of these today, but briefly. What was the Passover? The Passover was a day that the people of Israel remembered the night that God passed over, the, the angel of death passed over their homes and did not kill the firstborn. God said to Pharaoh, if you don't let go, Israel is my firstborn, meaning the nation of Israel is my firstborn. If you don't let them go, I will take your firstborn, Egypt. And God told Moses, tell the people to slay a lamb, dip hyssop into the blood, and put the blood on the top of the door and the doorposts. The angel of God will pass that house. And no firstborn of the Israelites or the Jews who were slaves was hurt. But the firstborn of the Egyptians died that night. We will have more time to study what happened that day and how they prepared. Now, immediately after the Passover is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We will study what unleavened bread means and how that unleavened bread is seen 
in the Last Supper in two weeks. Next week, we're going to study the Passover. The week following, we're going to study the unleavened bread. Doug, staying, let, let me stay for a little bit at, uh, at Passover. When the people were in Egypt and them coming out of Egypt, it represented something. We're going to study deeper next week, but what it was, was their being in slavery was indicative and symbolic of them being in the slavery of sin. In the slavery of sin. And sin is symbolized by leaven. By leaven. And that is what leads us to the next festival, which is called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This is when they ate unleavened bread. We will go through not only how they ate, how they made, but what they did around the house in a couple of weeks. We'll study that. But it was indicative, it was symbolic of taking sin out of their homes and out of their lives and confessing to God their condition. Then there was the feast of the first fruits. This is when the first harvest had taken place. It was barley. And they would take a sheaf of barley. A representative of Israel would bring a sheaf, one big bundle of barley to the priest. And the priest would hold it up and bless it. And that was a symbol of gratefulness, of thankfulness to God, of the land that he had given them where they could succeed where they could have agriculture, where they could have food and they could be supplied and they could build a nation. Now, these festivals not only have symbology going backward, but they also have symbology going forward, which was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. All of them. Then, after 50 days, we have the Feast of Pentecost. The Feast of Pentecost is a time. It's a feast of joy, a celebration. There's offerings, there's thankfulness, and there's all the blessings that people review. Now, do you remember what happened on the Feast of Pentecost after the resurrection of Jesus? It was exactly 50 days after and the appointed festival was celebrated for the first time for the first church in Jerusalem. It was a celebration of the harvest that was beginning, the harvest of the souls. Then we have the Feast of Trumpets. Feast of Trumpets comes in the seventh month, the Jewish People use the Babylonian names for their months. They call it Tishri. The seventh month on the first day. It's also called Yom Kippur. Sorry, it's also called uh, Rosh Hashanah. But the Feast of Trumpets is one the trumpet is blown and the people confess their sins. And in their confession, they bring all of their sins before God, and the trumpet calls the people for sacrifices and come for their confession. This is a nine days, some say ten, because at the end of the ninth day starts the Day of Atonement. Now, at the ninth day, after nine days, people have confessed their sins. A nation has confessed their sins. Then comes the Day of Atonement. What happens on the Day of Atonement? On the Day of Atonement, the priest makes two sacrifices, one on his behalf, a sacrifice of a bull. Then he has a second sacrifice of a goat on behalf of the entire nation, not individual, on the behalf of the entire nation. And they take the second goat, we call a zazel, and it let it go in the wilderness. This is a different sacrifice 
from the daily sacrifices that we, that we just saw earlier in Leviticus and in, and in Exodus 12. Exodus 12 explains all this as well. In fact, Exodus 12 gives us the details of these. So now, in the Day of Atonement, the people confess as a nation and they wait for God's decision on the judgment. The judgment is taking place on the 10 days prior. On this day, they wait for the judgment to be guilty or not guilty. But here's the difference. In the daily sacrifices, people confess their sins, what? As a nation? As what? As individuals through the head of the family. Through the head of the family, individual sins. We see Job. This is before, this is before uh, Moses. We're told Job prayed and confessed and intervened for his who? For himself? For his family. It was the head of the family that used to make the altar. The head of the family used to be the priest of the home. So the head of the families would go and take their sacrifices to the temple. So the confession and forgiveness of individual wrong, whether intentional wrong or unintentional wrong, was not done on the Day of Atonement. It was done prior to, prior to, during the year on the daily sacrifices. And then on the Passover, what happened? We have an estimate of approximately 250,000 lambs were slaughtered as sacrifices, one for every 10 people. So we know there was approximately two and a half million people in Jerusalem at Passover. That's more than the city of Toronto. Two and a half million people. For what? It was at Passover that they confessed their sins and each one brought their lamb. During the year, they may have done so. But on Passover, they had to come. Every family had to be represented to talk about their individual sins. And what is different from Passover to the Day of Atonement? In the Passover, it's individual. It's for families. Day of Atonement was never a time of investigative judgment of every person sins. Never was. It was a day for the confession and forgiveness of the nation. Of the nation. The last Hebrew holiday is the Tabernacles. What does Tabernacles, Feast of Tabernacles, represent? The Tabernacles started on the first day of Mishnah, which is when the actual tabernacle was completed. The Solomon's Temple was completed, and the opening ceremony was on the first day of Mishnah, when God came to tabernacle with his people. This tabernacle is God now going to live with his people. And the tabernacle is a tent point backward to the journey of Israel in the wilderness when they were in the tents and God was with them through the temple and through the cloud and through the pillar. God was with them. This then also points forward to that time when we're going to tabernacle with God with his heavenly sanctuary in heaven. We're going to study how on time, Jesus died on the Passover. Immediately following that, immediately following that, there was a feast of the unleavened bread. Then we have the first fruits. Then we have the Pentecost. But we don't have to wait. 1,800 years for the Day of Atonement. 
That is why the Bible tells us that Jesus was at the right hand of the Father when he went up to heaven. And he atoned for us. Last week, we studied and we reviewed some extra biblical reports from the Talmud, Babylonian Talmud, which stated what? That after the death of Christ for 40 years, from the time of the destruction of the temple, going back 40 years, the doors didn't stay closed. The western lamp couldn't be kept lit. Am I right? The crimson belt did not turn white. But that doesn't mean that that was the end of the ministry of Jesus. All of those things point to Jesus as the fulfillment of the Lamb. But we need to remember that Jesus didn't finish his work. He finished his work as the Lamb, but that same Jesus is also our high priest. He's also our high priest. We didn't study that last week, but that is the next step. And as we study these festivals, we will study the importance, we'll study the importance of that high priestly work that Jesus did. And that atonement starts when he goes into the most holy place. I'm going to share more with you in the coming weeks. I found it interesting in reviewing a book by Dr. Roy Adams. Uh, I consider him a good friend. And I hope he does me. In reviewing his book, The Sanctuary, The Heart, of the Adventist message. That's his book. As I was reading that again, I've read it more than once, I took note that he says that many people get hung up on the geography of the temple and to where is Jesus at what time? Where is Jesus at what time? And he suggests that we ought to ignore that debate because by that debate, Jesus is at the right hand of God in the most holy place. He, he says that clearly in his book. This is, a, 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 I believe at this point, the best cited Seventh-day Adventist scholar. He says, no problem. But he says, the geography is not important. It is the work that is important. And then he says that regardless of the geography, our interpretation by William Miller of the year 1844 is correct. Because even though geographically Jesus was in the most holy place when he went up, and he is, he didn't wait, wait until 1844, he, he acknowledges that. But his work of atonement doesn't start until 1844, and that atonement is really judgment. Now, God said very clearly that these are His festivals, His appointed times, and the geography of the temple is His geography. And God Himself said that on for this kind of animal, for this kind of sacrifice, you come in this gate and you sacrifice on this altar and this is where you put the blood and this is what you do with the intestines. You go and wash them and then you sacrifice them. And with the birds, he said, you don't have to cut them. He says, just have the priest break their neck, take off the feather. This is a lot of detail for God. Then he says, take him from the altar. Then he says, go into the holy place and over there is the bread and the water and the lampstand. And here's what you do in that part of the geography. But when you end up in the, 
The third part of the geography, this is why you go there and you only go there once a year. Because if the high priest goes there any other time, he's going to die. He has no business being there. So, the geography becomes important when God appoints the time to go there. High priest wasn't allowed to go there until the sacrifices were made. And he took the blood on his finger and he put it on there seven times for the bull and seven times for the goat. Seven times for himself and his family and seven times for, him, for, for the people of Israel. Now you tell me, Dr. Adams, why is the geography not important? The geography is everything. Because if anybody even touched the ark, they would die. And if Jesus is in the most holy place on the right hand of the Father, not the left, on the right hand, there's significance about that. We talked about it briefly before. When somebody sits on the right hand in the Sanhedrin, it's because they have been declared innocent. On the left hand, you're declared guilty and given a punishment. Jesus, on behalf of all of us, sits on the right hand of God, in the most holy place, keeping in mind the geography. There's no way Jesus would disobey the Father. When he said, you come into the most holy place with the blood that he may accept that sacrifice. And God accepted that sacrifice on our behalf, on behalf of the whole world. I want to read a passage from Leviticus. And the only reason is this. There is nothing more beautiful and nothing explains the word of God than the word of God. I'm going to read to you. It's a long passage. Bear with me. But we're going to close with this passage. Why? Because it reviews the seven festivals of Israel. And I want us this week to go home and read and study the Passover so next week we can study it in detail. Here's what it is. These are the Lord's appointed festivals. Verse 4 of chapter 23. The sacred assemblies you are to proclaim at their appointed times. The Lord's Passover begins at twilight on the 14th day of the first month. On the 15th day of that month, the Lord's festival of unleavened bread begins. For seven days you must eat bread made without yeast. On the first day, hold a sacred assembly and do no regular work. For seven days, present a food offering to the Lord. And on the seventh day, hold a sacred assembly and do no regular work. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, When you enter the land I am going to give you and reap its harvest, bring to the priests a sheaf of the first grain you harvest. He is, wave, he is to wave the sheaf before the Lord so it would be accepted on your behalf. The priest is to wave it on the day after the Sabbath. On the day you have... You wave the sheaf, you must sacrifice a burnt offering to the Lord, a lamb a year old without defect, together with its grain offering, and two tenths of an ephah, of the finest flour mixed with olive oil, a food offering presented to the Lord, a pleasing aroma, and its drink offering of a quarter and a hin of wine. You must not eat any bread or bread or roasted or new grain, until the very day you bring this offering to your God. This is to be a lasting ordinance for generations to come wherever you live. From the day after the Sabbath, the day you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, count off seven full weeks. Count off 50 days up to the day after the seventh Sabbath and then present an offering of new grain to the Lord. From wherever you live, bring two loaves made of two tenths of an ephah, of the finest flour, baked with yeast, as a wave offering of first fruits to the Lord. 
present with this bread seven male lambs, each a year old and without defect, one young bull and two rams. They will be a burnt offering to the Lord, together with their grain offerings and drink offerings, a food offering and aroma pleasing to the Lord. Then sacrifice one male goat for a sin offering and two lambs, each a year old, for a fellowship offering. The priest is to wave the two lambs before the Lord as a wave offering, together with the bread of the first fruits. They are a sacred offering to the Lord for the priest. On that same day, they are to proclaim a sacred assembly and do no regular work. This is to be a lasting ordinance for the generations to come wherever you live. When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Leave them for the poor and for foreigners residing among you. I am the Lord your God. Now we're going to the last three festivals in the month of Tishri. The Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israel, On the first day of the seventh month, you are to have a day of Sabbath rest, a sacred assembly commemorated with trumpet blasts. Do no regular work, but present a food offering to the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, verse 26, The tenth day of the seventh month is a day of atonement. Hold a sacred assembly and deny yourselves and present a food offering to the Lord. Do not do any work on that day because it is the day of atonement. When atonement is made for you before the Lord your God, those who do not deny themselves on that day must be cut off from their people. I will destroy from among their people anyone who does any work on that day. You shall do no work at all. This is to be a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. Wherever you live, it is a day of Sabbath rest for you, and you must deny yourselves. For the evening of the ninth day of the not month until the following evening, you are to observe your Sabbath. Verse 33, the Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, On the fifteenth day of the seventh month, the Lord's festival of tabernacles begins, and it lasts for seven days. The first day is a sacred assembly, do no regular work. For seven days present food offerings to the Lord, and on the eighth day hold a sacred assembly and present a food offering to the Lord. It is the closing special assembly, do no regular work. These are the Lord's appointed festival, which you are to proclaim as sacred assemblies for bringing food offerings to the Lord, the burnt offerings and grain offerings, sacrifices and drink offerings required for each day. These offerings are in addition to those for the Lord's Sabbaths, in addition to your gifts and whatever you have vowed, all free will offerings you give to the Lord. This is all in addition to what they were doing on their own and for their families. These are the national festivals. Now, before we close, I want to go to chapter 25, verse 8. Actually, rather than... Let me go ahead and read verse 1. The Lord said to Moses at Mount Sinai, Speak to the Israelites, say to them, When you enter the land, I am going to give you. The land itself must observe a Sabbath to the Lord. Do you understand that? The land must observe a Sabbath to the Lord. For six years, sow your fields, and for six years, prune your vineyards, and gather their crops. But in the seventh year, the land is to have a year of Sabbath rest a Sabbath to the Lord. Do not sow your fields or prune your vineyards. Do not reap what grows of itself or harvest the grapes of your untended vines. The land is to have a year of rest. Whatever the land yields during the Sabbath year will be food for you, yourself, your male and female servants, and the hired worker and temporary resident who live among you, as well as for your livestock and the wild animals in your land, whatever the land produces. Now comes the most interesting part. Verse 8 of chapter 25. Count off seven Sabbath years. 
seven times seven years, so that the seven Sabbath years amount to a period of 49 years. You get that? 49 years. Let's keep on reading. So you have a Sabbath year, a Sabbath of the land, after how many years? Every six years you plant and harvest. The seventh year is what? The Sabbath. You don't do anything to the land. So that's seven years. So you take seven times seven is how many years? 49 years. 49 years. So he said, now take, take a look at this. Then have the trumpet sounded everywhere on the 10th day of the seventh month. What's on the 10th day of the seventh month? Do you remember from what we just read in Leviticus, Leviticus 23? Is the day of atonement. Okay? On the day of atonement, sound the trumpet throughout your land, consecrate the 50th year, and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants, and shall be a jubilee for you. Each of you who should return to your family property and to your own clan, the 50th year shall be a jubilee for you. Do not sow and do not reap what grows itself, grows of itself, or harvest untended vines. For it is a jubilee, and it is to you holy. Eat only that which is given. In this year of jubilee, Everyone is to return to their own property. Now, if you keep on reading, here's what you find what happens on the Jubilee year. Every 50th year, all debts were forgiven. All debts were forgiven. If you sold your land to somebody, on the 50th year, you could go and get it back. Not only could you, you were required to get it back. That is the year of Jubilee. If you lost your property to debt on the 50th year, if you are dead, your children can go back and get it. That is the year of our Lord. That is the year of Jubilee. This is why Jesus says that I have come to preach freedom. I have come to give freedom. I, this, uh, to celebrate Jubilee on the Day of Atonement. In the year that Jesus died was the fulfillment of that jubilee year where all debts, everything was forgiven. No investigative judgment. Not at all. It was all about the year of jubilee. And it was because the people of Israel neglected the jubilee year, the seventh year Sabbath, they were greedy. And by the way, this, this teaches us to be selfless. That don't ignore that the rest of the Sabbath. Don't be so greedy that you've got to work on Sabbath. It teaches us to be selfless and less greedy. Give up chasing money. And that's what God was teaching them on the seventh year. Take it easy. Don't do anything. And then, when they did not keep that seventh year. Do you know what happened? God took them into slavery. Do you know where? Babylon. Do you know for how long? It tells you. 70 years. You know why? You know why? Because they ignored the Sabbath year for 490 years. So for every year that they ignored the Sabbath year, the people of Israel were to suffer in slavery the 70 years. It's all connected. It is all connected. When we begin to talk about when they're going to leave, they knew when they were going to leave. God punished them for 70 years to pay for the 490 years. My friends, the word of God is clear on his plan. And his plan is salvation for the entire world. There are no chosen people today. There is no remnant today. The remnant only existed for one reason. To take the gospel to the entire world. And that is what Jesus did. And that is why
the message of Revelation goes to the seven pagan churches, not to the Jewish church. Because now, all those churches, Ephesus, the book of Ephesians, Galatia, all those churches are the people of God. There is no need for a remnant. There is no message for the remnant. The gospel is for the entire world, for the whole world. And every believer has a responsibility to share it. It's the gospel. It's the gospel that we have to share. Not the last day events. It's the gospel. God bless you.